You know, the tribes of Israel were interesting, but you know, they became competitive, not complimentary. Competitive, not complimentary. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hember. And I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV as we go through the Bible. We're reading about the history of the Israelites. And this is fascinating because things are not going as they should. Corey, what's going on? Well, in Judges chapter nine, we go back to the city of Shechem uh, and we learn some interesting things that were going on there. Ryan, what do you have for us today? Well, today I'm profiling one of Israel's most famous or perhaps infamous judges, Samson. All right, infamous judges, very good. Janice, what did you do today? Well, it's our fun Friday wrap up. So I will be asking a question anywhere from Joshua chapter nine, all the way through to Judges chapter nine. Uh Oh, that's a good one. All right, get your Bible out. Let's learn what God said. Judges eight verses one through nine. Now the men of Ephraim said to him, Why have you done this to us by not calling us when you went to fight with the Midianites? And they reprimanded him sharply. So he said to them, What have I done now in comparison with you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Ebiezer? God has delivered into your hands the princes of Midian, Oreb, and Zeb. And what was I able to do in comparison with you? Then their anger toward him subsided when he said that. When Gideon came to the Jordan, he and the 300 men who were with him crossed over, exhausted but still in pursuit. Then he said to the men of Succoth, Please give loaves of bread to the people who follow me, for they are exhausted and I am pursuing Zeba and Zalmunna, kings of Midian. And the leaders of Succoth said, Are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna now in your hand that we should give bread to your army? So Gideon said, For this cause, when the Lord has delivered Zeba and Zalmunna into my hand, then I will tear your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars. Then he went up from there to Penuel and spoke to them in the same way. And the men of Penuel answered him as the men of Succoth had answered. So he also spoke to the men of Penuel, saying, When I come back in peace, I will tear down this tower. Judges chapter 8, verses 1 through 9. The book of Judges is amazing. Actually, as we continue our study through here, we are looking at the decline of Israel and how things have failed. But at the same time, in that decline, there are judges or leaders who rise up. And as we study through the Bible, we can see the level at which Israel fails God and that failing continues to grow. They fall at least seven times in the narrative book of Judges. Now, Gideon was the fifth judge of Israel, highlighted in these evil times. His call was unexpected, although even he himself did not anticipate that God had a place and placed him in the future of Israel's success. In fact, he placed it on him. But even through that, he was an amazing judge. Others did not expect him to win or do anything of value for Israel. But in today's scripture, we see what happened. And this is a tragic event. Since many of the men perished because they did not believe or understand how God worked in and through his called ones. Gideon was on pursuit to take down the Midianites and their leaders, but the leaders of Ephraim sharply criticized him. Gideon returned the challenge and they backed off. And then the men of Succoth, which Gideon and his men asked for water and something to eat, they denied him. And the way the tribes were isolating from each other, well, this is not helping each other and it's evidence of how far they had faded from God. Can you believe this? This is Israel, and this is the country that worked together. Uh, You know, when you think it through, when you begin to understand what God is doing here, he's trying to show them the truth, and they still are declining. 
And that's really important. Take your Bible guide and turn today to the day's passage. It is a good one. If you don't have one, why not? Write for it or go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Click on the page and when you do so, it will take you to a donate page. Thank you very much for your donations. We appreciate that. And uh, also Bible Discovery Studios. Bible Discovery Studios, that's another place where you can see the video we produce uh, on the program and, and uh, here at the studio. So that's really, really good. Today is Gideon. A lot of people talk about Gideon. We're going to read about him. Father, I pray today that, that we would hear your Holy Spirit speak and talk about Gideon. I pray, Father, that you would show us your ways through his life. Teach us your paths through his actions. In Jesus' wonderful name. And we said together, amen. Now remember, God does not change. Okay, we change. Time changes us. God does not change. He's the same. He's supreme. He's divine. He's the same. All right, so now we go to Judges chapter 8. And Gideon was chosen by God. Very interesting. Previous to this. Now we're in this time of a battle. Gideon's going after people because God gave him the permission to do that. Now the men of Ephraim said to him, he runs into the camp of Ephraim, and the men of Ephraim said to him, why, why have you done this to us by not calling us when you went to fight with the Midianites? And they reprimanded him sharply. So he said to them, what have I done now in comparison with you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abyssal? God has delivered into your hands the prince of Midian, Orab and Zeb. And what was I able to do in comparison with you? And then their anger toward him subsided when, they, when he said that. Now, this is fascinating. You see, the tribes of Israel, they were competitive with each other. They were not complimentary. They didn't help each other. They competed with each other. But the Lord has called us to win the world, beloved. You and me and everybody else who is a Christian, we are all called to win the world, not to compete with each other. We don't compete with each other. Listen, the American way, and I'm American, is to compete with each other. I got it. The Canadian way is to compete with each other. No, we, as Christians, we don't compete with each other. But what we do is we have one thing in mind. Suddenly, the, the business responsibility goes down some, and above that is the responsibility to God and family. That's up here now. And as a Christian, we've changed. And as we've changed, that's reflected in the way we act. Because how we believe is how we act. How we act brings people to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Simple. That's the truth, beloved. Now, let's go on because this gets even better as we focus on it. We look at verse uh, 4 of chapter 8. When Gideon came to the Jordan, he and 300 men who were with him crossed over exhausted but still in pursuit. And then he said to the men of Succoth, please give loaves of bread to the people who follow me for they are exhausted, and I am pursuing Zeba and Zalim and the kings of Midian. And the leaders of Succoth said, Are we, or are the hands of Zeba and Zalim now in your hand that we should give bread to your army? So Gideon said, For this cause, when the Lord has delivered Zeba and Zalamuna into my hand, then I will tear your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness and with the briars. Which brings me to the second point. Gideon promised to deliver devastating results to those who did not help him. Beloved, we must keep our ways and our work focused towards God. We have to remain focused towards God. Very important. Remember this. This is Gideon showing us the truth. Now, now go to chapter 8, verse 8 and 9. Watch this now. Then he went up from there to Peniel and spoke to them in the same way. And the men of Peniel also answered him, as the men of Succoth had answered him. So he also spoke to the men of Peniel, saying, When I come back in peace, I will tear down this 
tower. That's fascinating. You see, destruction continues as Gideon brings deliverance to Israel. We should respond to the call of God and the call of God has placed on our life rather than the advice of others. I, I think today is the time when we always look for what everybody else thinks, especially on social media. Wonder what they think. Wonder what they think. Wonder what, forget what they think. What does God say? Not what does God think. What does he say to you? If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, I'm not talking to you. If you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, I'm not speaking to you. I, I, I speak to you, but I'm not talking to you now. Believers, listen to what God says. When God speaks to you, that's what you do, regardless of what anybody else thinks. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Lord, today... Help me to listen. I want to hear what you are saying. What you're saying to me, because you speak to everybody. So help me, Lord. And in Jesus' wonderful name, this is what we ask, Lord, that you would help us to do exactly what it is that you've called us to do so that we can actually respond to you and do your will. Help us, Lord, in Jesus' name. And we all said together, amen. Well, it's time now to continue on with our Bible study. And I know our assignment is Judges 7 to 9, but I actually want to jump ahead a bit so that we can focus on Samson. And this was a time in Israel's history when everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes. There weren't any Jewish kings yet, but God raised up leaders to judge and deliver his people from the hands of their enemies. Samson was one of those deliverers. And though he was mostly reckless, God was still able to use him. Check it out. Prior to the rule of any Israelite king, when everyone was doing what was right in his own eyes, was born Samson. Even before the womb, God had ordained him to be a judge among his people and to begin delivering the Israelites from the hands of the Philistines. He was to be a Nazarite, one set apart to God from birth. But his reckless behavior and weakness for women made him seem a very poor choice. At first, everything seemed to be going according to plan. Samson grew, and the Spirit of the Lord began to move upon him. But Samson decided to marry a Philistine woman, which aggravated his parents. Yet there was no talking him out of it. This choice set him on a deadly collision course with the Philistines. Deadly for them, deadly for him. Indeed, though Samson's parents were unaware, God was using this opportunity to ultimately bring the Philistines to ruin. It first began to manifest during the seven-day wedding feast. For when Samson discovers that he has been conspired against by his bride and some Philistines over a wager he made, he leaves in a rage. When he returns and finds that his wife has been given over to another man, he burns the Philistines' grain fields, vineyards, and olive groves. When the Philistines return fire and burn his wife and her father, Samson makes a great slaughter of them all. Though Samson returned home, he would soon be arrested by his own people and delivered back to the Philistines. However, the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and with nothing more than a donkey's jawbone, he slew a thousand men. Although the Philistines would make another attempt upon Samson during his one night stay with a harlot in Gaza, he once again escaped. For twenty years, Samson had overpowered and eluded the Philistines, but all of that was about to change. For when they learn of Samson's love for Delilah, they offer her a significant sum of silver if she can discover the secret of Samson's power. After a great deal of enticement, Samson finally breaks down. No razor has ever come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave me. Now exposed, Delilah lulls Samson to sleep and has his head shaved. In moments, the angry Philistine mob is upon him, but he is powerless. 
so he's blinded, shackled, and imprisoned. Yet Samson's divine mission was not yet complete. Indeed, sometime later, when his hair had partially returned, he's brought to the Philistine temple for the entertainment of thousands. But Samson sets himself between two supporting pillars, and in one last prayer he pleads with God, let me die with the Philistines. So he pushed with all his might, and the temple fell on all the people who were in it. So the dead that he killed at his death were more than he had killed in his life. You know, some of us have a really hard time understanding how God could have endorsed Samson's behavior. Because, I mean, the account speaks of Samson's marriage to the Philistine woman as if it's actually from God. But Israelites were not to intermarry with outsiders. So what's going on here? Well, you know, I like what Bible scholar Dale Davis says about it. He says that, yes, Yahweh was the one seeking an occasion against the Philistines, but that doesn't mean God condoned everything Samson did or the way that he did it. The sin of Samson mustn't be attributed to the Lord, but the deliverance of the Israelites by Samson was from the Lord. I remember, he says, scriptural language frequently attributes directly to God what he merely permits. Samson surely was directed by God to seek an occasion against the Philistines and to lead the Israelites in breaking out from under their yoke. But Samson didn't take the time to inquire of the Lord how or in what legitimate ways that he might do this. Nor did he seek divine guidance when his parents questioned his seeking a bride among the Philistines. All that mattered was whether he was pleased, whether his choice was right in his own eyes. A little wonder then that he would only begin to deliver Israel from the Philistines. Perhaps his potential for greatness was cut short by his vices, his partaking too deeply of the cultural appetites of his day. You know, it goes without saying, but let's not be like Samson. Let's seek God's face and inquire of him what he would have us do. I think one of the things that's interesting, Ryan, is that Samson was selfish in many ways, and he was looking for what he wanted. And, uh, you know, many of us today, are we feed that selfishness. You look at the commercials on television, and you, what do you see is, you know, how to make yourself happy and all of that. But selfishness is very important to avoid because God has called us to be selfless, not selfish. And I think that's very important. Thank you, Ryan, for that report. Corey? Today, I'm going to be going to Judges chapter 9, and I'm going to be focusing in on the murderous rampage of Abimelech before he himself is killed in that. We learn in Judges chapter 9, uh, you know, at the city of Shechem, that there was a fortress temple to someone called El Bereth, the Lord of Bereth. Now, this pagan temple uh, becomes uh, uh, the scene of, um, you know, a, a large homicide, essentially, where Abimelech sets a fire uh, around the building and eventually smokes out and kills everyone, just about a thousand people who are hiding in this fortress temple combination. Well, archaeologists believe that they actually have the remains of that very temple. Take a look. Thanks to ongoing archaeological work that began in the early 1900s, much is known about the ancient city of Shechem. Shechem is a city featured often in the Bible, and historically, it held a great amount of power and influence. This power is likely why Abimelech, the son of Gideon, launched a bid for kingship at Shechem, as recorded in the biblical book of Judges. While he did rule for three years, Abimelech's hold was not to last. He was betrayed by the men of Shechem, whom he then defeated in battle and turned his sights on destroying what is called the fortress or stronghold of the Temple of Baal Bereth. Abimelech set fires along the walls of this tower, eventually suffocating and burning all those who had huddled themselves inside. Excavations at Shechem in the 1920s unearthed what was then the largest fortress temple known in Canaan. With two towers guarding its entrance, Shechem's temple still boasts 17-foot thick foundation walls. On top of those walls would have been high mud brick and wooden walls supporting the multiple stories of the temple. Stairwells in the front towers would have reached those floors. In the courtyard that spread out before the temple, there was a large sacrificial altar and three standing stones. Two of the stones flanked the entrance, while the largest occupied its own spot in the courtyard. It was five feet wide and around ten feet tall, and though broken off in antiquity, it still stands five feet tall today. 
The late Professor Lawrence Steger has advocated for the natural association of this fortress temple with Abimelech's temple in Judges 9. The temple was originally built sometime in the 16 or 1500s BC, making it an already ancient stronghold by the days of Abimelech. Standing stones in and around Shechem are mentioned in the biblical histories of Joshua and Abimelech, so it's no surprise that they've also been found at Shechem's fortress temple. Unfortunately for us, these stones were not carved with the writing that once adorned their surface. They were plastered and painted on, all of which has since been lost to time. Interesting, isn't it? Not only to be able to see some of the remains from this fortress temple, uh, also the fact that there were such things as fortress temples, places of refuge for people to go that were associated with pagan gods and goddesses, but also to know the dating of this original temple means that it would have been in Shechem during the conquest of the Promised Land by Joshua and the Israelites, and that they didn't destroy it at that point which just furthers, if you've been watching Bible Discovery over the last few weeks, you've noticed that we've talked a lot about Shechem and how a peace treaty must have been struck between the Israelites and the people at Shechem. So the fact that this, that Shechem wasn't destroyed and that this was allowed to stay here, even though it became a center of, um, you know, worship of the biblical God, uh, is another one of those signs that points towards some sort of a peace treaty or agreement between the Israelites and the people. People of you know, what's interesting, Corey, is that people uh, don't maybe realize this, but as we as we have been reading through this, it it comes into Joshua at the end, of course, of Deuteronomy. Moses passes away, and the first couple of chapters of uh, Joshua, he talks about, you know, we're going to go in and we're going to take over, and they do, but they never really finish it. They leave the people there. And uh, so what happens is a lot of these treaties go into place. And this is fascinating because, I mean, it gets it becomes a problem. And God actually says, wait a minute. Now, I'm going to leave these nations there to test you, Israel, because you don't know what it is to come out of Egypt. And he keeps bringing this idea up of coming out of slavery, coming out of Egypt. That's absolutely fascinating. And we need to pay attention because we have to remember the past. And I think today we've seen a lot of people who have uh, simply said, well, the past is no good. Therefore, we're going to get rid of it. We're going to get rid of the past. That becomes a problem. We need to face the past with reality and understand it and see that, you know, there were mistakes that were made just like we, you and I, are making mistakes today. We've got to be careful that we understand nobody's perfect, including us today, in a big way. And we look to Jesus Christ to correct us and make us people who are better and more perfect. Jesus Christ, the Lord God. That's important. Very good. All right, Janice, well, today is a good day. So yes. are you, you going to get to it right we, away or no? Well, no, because it is Friday, but I want to give Corey just a moment to remind viewers about some details of the last week that we've studied. Corey? Thank you. Well, yes. Okay. So every single Saturday, I upload a video uh, to YouTube, to my YouTube channel, which is Corey Babechko, C O R I E B O B E C H K O. So every Saturday morning, I upload a video that is a chapter by chapter recap, going over the main details of everything that was assigned to us to read in the discovery guide, everything we covered on the program. And that's just to help you get caught up if you've fallen behind in your reading or to help you kind of test your memory and solidify your Bible knowledge as you're going through. I also try to stay really present in the comment section. I record the videos on Friday nights and I upload them really early Saturday morning, my time. Uh, and I try to stay present in the comment section to uh, chat with you about any of your comments and things that have gone on that week in the reading and, and uh, answer some questions as well. So if you're interested in that, look me up on YouTube. Again, my channel name is Corey Babechko. My name's, that's C-O-R-I-E-B-O-B-E-C-H-K-O. All right, so now I'm going to have fun with some details. I am looking at anywhere from Joshua chapter 9 through to Judges chapter 9, which of these three judges was known to be left-handed? Number one, Othniel, 
number two, Ehud, number three, Shamgar. Who do I have something similar as I'm left-handed? Who of these judges was known to be left-handed? Do you know? Corey and Ryan. <laughs> Corey and Ryan. Yeah. I know, but I do you I, know? I think I know. Yeah, I think that I'm going to go with number two, Ehud, uh, one of my favorite guys. Definitely Ehud. I second that. Definitely Ehud. Very good. If you also said Ehud, you're absolutely right. You'll find that in Judges chapter three. The story of Ehud is wonderful. And you'll find that in uh, verses 12 through 30. Othniel, of course, conquered Cushan Rishathaim, the king of Mesopotamia, and brought peace to Israel for 40 years on their land. And Shamgar, he too was a judge, and he killed 600 Philistine men with an ox goad. And you can read about him in Judges chapter 3, verse 31. So there you go. Um, Ehud was a Benjamite and a left-handed man. And that story, you might say, well, what's the big deal? Read about it. It's quite fascinating. Never before have I felt such urgency to pray for the church. And today I pray for the church in North America, in the United States of America and in Canada. Father, forgive us for our sins. Help us, Lord. We need Jesus Christ in our place today. We need the Lord Jesus Christ. Come Lord Jesus Christ, be active in us. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. And we said together, amen.